as this impacts both the international and domestic politics and economics of several countries, there is a need to control the excessive foreign capital inflows, that is, especially in the developing economies, that's the debate that also gains the momentum. In this edition of Public Forum, we'll try and analyze the currency wars as well as the currency fluctuation and impact on the political as well as economic stability of various countries. Joining us in the studio is uh, Dr. Devi Bhattacharya, Vice Chancellor of JNU. Uh, Dr. Ram Upendra Das, he's the Senior Fellow with Research and Information System for Developing Countries, and Dr. Jiri Agarwal, the Chairman of Indian Institute of Finance. So let us begin the discussion uh, first of all by understanding the term currency wars. Uh, Dr. Ram Upendra Das, uh, how would you like to just brief us a bit on uh, the currency wars? Well, Currency wars uh, essentially mean in the context of currencies fluctuating either upwards or downwards because of the responses of different countries and uh, one country's response being in response to another country's response and uh, all this is to actually um, stabilize their exchange rates which is incumbent upon the demand as well as supply of capital flows. And this has wider macroeconomic implications domestically as well as globally. So I would caption it as if a country trying to defend its currency either upwards or downwards depending on the situation in response to another country and if this response actually multiplies in different countries then you may Okay, let us look at our uh, position here. India has seen a dollar inflow uh, over the past few months, and in fact, the rupee has also risen uh, as compared as against dollar. How do you look at India really reacting to this uh, currency war situation? You see, the India's stance has always been that to keep a rupee, to keep rupee weak. There are several reasons for this, and one of the most important reasons is that the exporters have a very strong lobby, and they want India to keep the rupee weak so that they, their competitiveness in the international market may be maintained, and they may be able to really sell more goods and services abroad. The, but it has its own implications. For instance, uh, Mr. Subarao has very rightly pointed out uh, that liquidity to buying dollars and intervening in a market and buying dollars has its own cost because it increases liquidity in turn it increases uh, inflation and when the liquidity increases the rate of interest may go up that may also affect the competitiveness of the domestic industry of course there are a number of other factors as well uh, so what we see really that uh, India's currency has gained in the last two months by almost 8 to 9 percent. In my opinion, uh, this gain is good. And the Reserve Bank of India, or the Central Bank, should not intervene so long as there are not too wide fluctuations and they, the factors are unexplainable. If the factors are explainable, for instance, if the dollar is getting weak, if the US economy is not doing well, if other currencies are not doing well, and India is gaining strength, and India is shining, doing well, then naturally India's currency would gain. And since our imports are more than exports, and we have a trade deficit, it is good for the country to have a stronger mm. currency rather than a weak currency in the long run. Okay, uh, how do you really respond to this present situation, Dr. Patichara? Shalini, I think. <coughs> If we distinguish between two kinds of the currency volatility, one is the market-driven volatility, which comes from time-to-time -time demand and supply imbalances. The other is policy-induced intervention in the currency market to <coughs> deliberately go contra-market. So the currency war that we are talking today is some countries, it began from China, were 
delivery key time to control the currency against the market determining value and doing it in a decisive way. It all began from China, who was artificially keeping his own currency weak, even though they have three trillion dollars worth of furnished and reserves, all their own, forcing USA now to retaliation. Okay, if you can do it, we'll do it. Actually, Euro has already gone down quite a bit in the last couple of months. The USA finding the three major trading blocks, Euro, China, and USA. USA is the loser. Euro has gone down, <coughs> partly because of its own internal problem of the debt crisis. China artificially and forcefully keeping its currency, currency very much below. So USA starts. Now problem for countries like India now is <coughs> three major players in the global market all keen now to push their currency down. Mm. Had there been, say, one block against another block, India could have played the game. Now is the problem for India. It's a major edge problem. Mm. Most important is that not only internationally, uh, if, we, if we look at uh, the domestic response to this entire thing, Dr. Das, what is your opinion on this? The high capital inflows that we've seen and the way now country is coping up uh, to deal with this. Well, uh, Indian response has been very cautious and uh, perhaps it is very correct because we don't want to enter into this currency war at this stage. Uh, we are uh, watchful, but the government is watchful. Um, yes, uh, our currency is appreciating. Um, there are foreign institutional investors who are actually interested in India. Now, there is a flip side to it. I would say that this situation, in the aftermath of the global financial meltdown, right. which essentially was characterized by little p crunch in the developed countries, today is seeing the problem of oversupply of capital mm. to the developing world. Mm. And uh, in that sense, I would say that at least liquidity is not a problem. But what needs to be underlined is what kind of liquidity. And that is where we need to be more watchful that the hot money or the short-term capital inflows uh, that are interested in the Indian market for speculative purposes um, fine uh, to the extent that we have liberalized, we cannot say no to them at this stage. But we are watchful on that and I'm very sure if this goes beyond a point, government will definitely be But at the same time, how do you really assess its impact on uh, the advanced economies as well as the emerging economies? Well, um, in terms of advanced economies, the capital is trying to flow into markets where it can be high returns because it is not reaping high returns in other markets, including the developed world. So, uh, they are in search of high return. Mm -hmm. So, they would definitely gain if they divert their capital to emerging markets. Emerging markets would definitely gain because of the liquidity. Now, if this liquidity availability is more in the form of foreign direct investment, which is actually, um, in a sense, uh, employment generating, income generating as compared to foreign institutional investors, uh, I would say that this kind of investment uh, would be most welcome. Mm -hmm. Now, the pressure on our exchange rate and the recent appreciation uh, definitely would be an outcome of both kinds of uh, uh, capital flows. But what worries us is that the recent inflows have been short term okay. capital flows and we will have to be... That is, it is more FII based uh, right. than the FDI thing, which would have really helped us a lot. Yes. So, does that, uh, does that really present a very positive picture uh, for our country, for India? The, does that really present a very positive picture for our country? I mean, the kind of inflows that we are watching right now. No, I, I think if we really carry out a social cost benefit analysis of fluctuations which are taking place, rupee versus dollar or rupee versus euro, then we will find there are lots of private costs and also private benefits. And at the same time, we find there are lots of social costs, but there don't seem to be much of social 
benefits when the rupee devalues or depreciates against dollar. Mm. If you really look at the private benefits, I would say uh, private costs. If I would say the cost of holding reserves is a very important cost for the Reserve Bank of India. More the reserves, more is the cost for holding those reserves. Of course, our reserves are very nice and comfortable, and therefore there is nothing much for us to worry about that. The second thing is industry using imported raw material, for instance, uh, loses its competitiveness. If you import raw material, add value to that, then you export that, then you are in a, you lose your competitiveness. And even domestically, it adds to your inflation, therefore there is a private cost to the industry. Foreign travel, advertising, publicity becomes costly. Mm -hmm. Because when the rupee is cheap, uh, rupee is weaker, at that time, the ticket which you take, or uh, the advertising which you carry out, the publicity you carry out internationally, and even the foreign travel will be costlier. And therefore, it would better people not to uh, resort to that. Mm. And unless you advertise your products and services, and also India internationally, it would become difficult for us really to sustain. Mm. Uh, lastly, the importers may also, you know, pay more and get less in terms of quantities, when they, because it is in terms of rupees. Similarly, there are social costs involved. For instance, there is an inflation. There is a both cost push as well as capital in terms of co capital cost. When there is a uh, cost push, for instance, the raw material which you are importing, first of all, the transportation cost is worked out in terms of dollars. Insurance cost is worked out in dollars. Customs duties are paid on rupee. When it is 50 rupees and it is 40 rupees. So 10 rupees differential means extra payment to be made. Then value addition will be on 50 rupees, not on 40 rupees. And then excise, customs, and even uh, you know the, 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 uh, the sales tax, etc. will be added on rupees 50, mm -hmm. not on 40. All that adds to adding to inflation. And therefore there's a cost push. Okay, so there, there, there happens to be a lot of, uh, I mean there are sort of, a lot of things which uh, have an impact basically on this. But uh, in fact, minutes before this, uh, Dr. Patishwari, you were talking about some policy-induced currency war here. Are we somewhere trying to say the kind of easy monetary policy of the advanced economies which was considered to be the root cause behind this? Well, there is a subtle difference between the easy monetary policy to finance the government, hmm. the budget, <coughs> especially the deficit budget. The other one is here, tackling the external transactions okay. of the okay. So one is concerned about domestic transactions. The other one, the other one is internal. Now, coming to the question, <coughs> if all the major blocks of the world are determined to undervalue their currency, then first of all, <coughs> India will have a limited option. We are not yet a major player to decisively influence the global trend. Though we are not yet a large transactor in the global market as yet, but we are caught in the dilemma. So what we can do? <coughs> A, we try to restrict the inflow of FII. Now let me give an example. <coughs> China, in spite of such a huge financial reserves, in spite of complete open door policy with respect to investment, does not give a complete red carpet treatment to FII. Mm. That's the reason China is able to keep its exchange rate tight. Mm. So it is not getting pushed by, by the domestic capital inflow of FII time. The other successful model that India should borrow, so <coughs> China is the worst case in that sense, extreme. Chile. Mm. Chile is the most stabilized currency market for nearly 30 years. Having suffered a lot during the 70s, Chile had adopted a model that is now considered the textbook model for currency stabilization. Mm -hmm. Smaller level, Taiwan has done it. I would suggest India follow the Chilean model. Chilean model essentially means <coughs> you keep a premium on the capital coming mm -hmm. in terms of the return to the domestic. Okay. If foreign capital wants to have a party don't allow for parking. Allow them for investment purpose. If they still want to have a parking lot, tell them 30% is reserved with us for our long-term investment, which we don't do. 
You see, in that case, the real genuine FIIs would have, while looking at the market of 9% or 10% GDP growth, want to take advantage. <clears throat> but India, unfortunately, is not having enough confidence to adopt this model. Which TV has done it very successfully. Mm. So is China. Chinese, although Chinese artificially peg the currency, but in terms of FIA, they also make it clear. You are not given a freedom to come fly by night operators. Mm. Yes, our stock market will welcome you, but then you must stay for a certain period of time. Right. Indian FIA mm. policy is you pay zero tax if you stay for one year. Or if you can also route it through Mauritius, mm. again it is zero. And half the FII coming through Mauritius, if you look at the RBI data. If you stay otherwise, non-Mauritius, and stay only for one year, you pay only 10%. Okay. Whereas if you bring the capital to FBI, the return you pay 40%. Okay. So there are a lot of differences there, and maybe some sort of reforms also required in that direction. Yes, and it's a reverse direction. Okay. Okay. It's a less tax on a BI. Right. More tax on a fire. Okay. Okay. So, so that's that's a very important thing uh, that Dr. Bhattacharya has pointed to. It's time for a very short break in public forum. Stay tuned for more. Welcome back to Public Forum. In Public Forum today, we are discussing currency fluctuation and its impact on global economic and political stability. We know about the strong capital inflows from the advanced economies that has led to a sharp appreciation of rupee against the US dollar and uh, According to the data, the FII has pumped in almost $34.36 billion uh, between January and October in India. But uh, before going into the break, as uh, we were talking about the kind of structure we have in our country, Dr. Das, uh, would you really uh, concur with what Dr. Bhattacharya just said about having a model like the Chilean model or maybe even the Chinese model when it comes to FII's 
the kind of model that we have uh, for the FDIs rather should be probably replicated even in case of FIRs or uh, also to have a better model than this. No, I'm very glad that Professor Bhattacharya mentioned uh, the Chilean model. Uh, this uh, is something which we also don't understand why we have not given serious consideration um, and we should be doing it. In fact, uh, uh, between the Chilean and the Chinese model, there have been some other responses in recent times. For instance, Brazil imposed a transaction tax. I mean, not exactly that, but some kind of tax on foreign uh, inflows right. of that time. Thailand at the time. G20 finance ministers meetings uh, that were being held in South Korea. South Korea itself has already done it. So, in some way, you know, capital controls are also coming in isolated way. Uh, and that also is important to take note of. Uh, I would supplement Professor Bhattacharya's uh, point, uh, which was very valid, uh, by saying that uh, perhaps our responses need to be coordinated at the regional or global level. Now, at the global level, G20 is definitely handling uh, issues, but I guess this is going to be a major issue uh, when the forthcoming summit uh, comes up. More importantly, uh, this East Asia Summit, which is ASEAN 10, plus uh, Japan, China, South Korea, India, Australia, New Zealand. And this year, US and uh, Russia are also expected to be there, which is ASEAN plus 6 plus 2. Yeah. I think tomorrow, possibly, I just hope uh, that uh, this summit takes cognizance of the need and imperatives of a coordinated effort mm -hmm. uh, to address quote-unquote currency wars. Because unless we do it in a regional forum, and regional forum of uh, East Asia Summit kind uh, actually... Uh, but the finance ministers meet of the G20, the first part of G20 rather, was unable to address this issue. That is how the media reports are pointing to. That's correct, that's correct. But I think we need to emphasize uh, that unless a coordinated effort is made by major players, um, we would not be able to contain these individual country responses. Mm -hmm. And it is not in, in, in it will not augur well for the health of the global economy. Okay. Considering the kind of response that Brazil and Thailand have also given to it, do you think we need major reforms in the way we are dealing with these uh, capital inflows? I think we fairly handling the way of handling the foreign exchange uh, fluctuations fairly well. But as far as the question of China and Chile is concerned, mm -hmm. Chile has only $2 billion for an exchange reserve, small country, and very close to North America. It's a South American country. And therefore, the rich people and the bankers from America can influence their economy greatly. And therefore, they had to impose restrictions in terms of withdrawing money. The capital which comes into this, they have imposed various restrictions. As far as China is concerned, with foreign exchange reserves over a trillion dollars, has the capacity to induct currency war internationally. The moment it decides that it is going to keep a part, 10%, 20%, 30% of its reserves into euro or in pound sterling or in dollar, you know, the international market, you know, shakes. Mm -hmm. India, with $280 billion, does not have that capacity. But at the same time, we have been, by and large, if you look at for the last one, one and a half years or so, our, our dollar parity with dollar, uh, rupee was about 48, 47, 49, and so on and so forth. It's only in the last two months that it has gained strength, and it is about 44 rupees, 70 pesa, 75 pesa, and it's fluctuating that way. I think we've been managing that. As far as capital inflows are concerned, we should not really worry about it. And if we really look at from both the Ministry of Finance and Reserve Bank of India would be interested to keep the rupee low because there, is a, there are private benefits accruing to Ministry of Finance because the indirect taxes accruing to Ministry of Finance are much larger when the rupee is weaker. Similarly, when you prepare the balance sheet in rupee term for Reserve Bank of India in, with about $280 billion for exchange reserve, you know, your balance sheet shakes, even if it is, if the rupee is stronger by one rupee, and, and therefore the balance sheet in rupee terms will be weaker. Mm -hmm. And therefore both of them 
have, have the private benefit. Exporters have the private benefit revenue out of the weak rupee. But ultimately, one needs to really see not from this partic one particular sector, from the whole eco point, point of view of the whole economy. We import about 70% of the oil from abroad. That has its effects directly on consumer prices, on inflation, on the, on, on the growth, development of the economy. And therefore, that, that is a very important factor. They are now for our defense supply, import, for our capital equipments which we import from abroad, the cost of capital equipments will go up, the project cost will be high. And the ultimate cost of production will be high because the capital cost is high, mm. because it is all in terms of rupees. I think a moderate value of rupee, which is determined by the market, should be accepted. When there are wide fluctuations, the central bank should intervene because those wide fluctuations could be because of un unexplained factors. Okay, there is one important factor which has been, uh, in fact, uh, highlighted time and again, that these inflows really... Uh, erode the export competitiveness of these nations. How would you please, would you please elaborate on that? They are politically and consumer point of view quite popular because they lead to stock market appreciation. Many people are rejoicing therefore. Those who are holding those stocks <coughs> with FIA inflow has pushed the stock price and Bombay Sensex cross 20,000 right. and so on. So you see there are popular also appreciation of the positive side of the FI inflow. I presume that might be the reason why the government of India will be reluctant to suppress the FI inflow mm -hmm. because Bombay stock market uh, upswing is considered to be a psychological mm -hmm. uh, barometer <coughs> for state of the Indian economy. Whether we agree or disagree, unfortunately, it is considered in certain certain. So that point of view, FII is a very good thing. Your point is substantial. <coughs> Coming to the real side of it, how much impact it makes on the real economy, I think lots of apprehensions are about it. Because the FII tracing flows, the real economy impact has not been noted to be very big. There are indirect effects. Booming stock market is attracting a lot more private offering issues. So many companies have suddenly revived their market in issues and they're raising lots of capital. And that means promoting the private investor. Hopefully this private investment over a period of time will generate more output and more mm. Because when stock market goes down, companies are reluctant to issue public offers. Okay. So mm. that is the reason. But then Ultimately, economics is all about balancing. You can't be completely swinging in one direction. Mm -hmm. So the Reserve Bank of India will have to operate within a balancing framework. Mm -hmm. To me, at the moment, <coughs> rupee is still not that strong. You remember a couple of years ago, it came even up to 38. And then we intervened. So, market can absorb some more time. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, what will happen? Even if we rupee don't do, the global market competitions of currency war will prevail upon the larger players in the world market to push their currency up. And then by definition, we will be also having Mm -hmm. some impact positively. So it has the integration of the global economy has now become so strong, many cases it can neutralize your domestic policy. That's why I highlight the fact China has now the muscle power in a manner which most European countries do not have intervention. In the whole of Europe only Germany probably has some financial muscle power. The rest are all swinging. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> Americans the present protectionist sentiment is let us treat China as a <coughs> self. So if China can do it, who will do it? So it is not that America is inherently having a weak dollar. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it is American sentiment has gone to such an extent. Treat China as a self. So that is the factor 
the dollar becomes intrinsically weak, our capability to intervene in the market will also be further restricted. Okay, so there's a lot so, of uh, politics uh, and economics in fact involved in some this. Some battle is going to be fought between mm -hmm. China and America in particular. So India can watch for a while and don't jump into the bandwagon immediately. Okay, so a wait and watch policy right now for <coughs> India as one of our panelists are also pointing to us. Time for a very short break in public for institute. or let me introduce call us on our phone numbers. Our phone fee lines are open for you. The numbers are 1 800 So uh, before going into the break, as we were talking about the kind of policy reforms that probably are required and most importantly, the wait and watch policy that is supposed to be required by India at this point as China and US really face this. Uh, it's also important to look at the way Economies like Brazil and, uh, and Thailand have responded to this because uh, Brazil, as of now, it has raised its foreign inflow tax from 4% to 6%, and Thailand uh, is known for its open economy and has also taken a recourse that way. How do you look at the kind of uh, mechanisms that have been adopted by these countries? Then, I mean, these are very natural responses because, uh, especially in Thailand, uh, when the Thai bath was under a severe attack, I think I just remember that it was the first country uh, to have uh, met with the crisis, and it was the contagion which actually made it spread uh, to other countries. I would uh, consider these responses as very natural responses. But uh, let me just go back uh, because. Uh, Conceptually, we need to understand uh, a few things uh, when we discuss about the policy responses. The whole issue of export competitiveness uh, through a depreciation mm -hmm. um, is sometimes, I feel, uh, a little exaggerated uh, aspect. Uh, there are economic and policy studies, uh, the, the conclusions are not exactly the same. Why does that happen? When Say dollar uh, rupee depreciates with a dollar. Say hundred dollar worth of export earnings received by an exporter post depreciation mm -hmm. would fetch him more rupees. Right? So in that sense, the exporter has earned more in terms of local currency, even if the dollar earning is the same. Now we presume that our export competitiveness would improve. 
because we presume that the additional rupee that we have got because of rupees depreciation would actually be passed on to further lowering of export price when he sends the next consignment. Right. Like that, that might not happen. happen. Right. If it does not happen, then depreciation of exchange rate and local currency increased earning may not uh, get reflected in uh, increased exports. So this linkage uh, is not automatic. Mm -hmm. um, now, if this linkage is not automatic, then that brings me to the second point, that exchange rate variations, this is only one of the variables mm -hmm. of determining, say, export performance. Import is a different thing, you know, import is dependent on GDP and, and things like that. But as far as export performance is concerned, exchange rate, which is a price factor, is only one of the variables. There are many non-price factors. Also, exchange rate is only one of the variables in the sense that even if we have increased our export competitiveness, exports are as much a function of the global demand as much they are yeah. in terms of domestic. Yeah. Okay. So, and there was a fallacy of competition in 1997 when everybody's export comp competitiveness increased in Southeast Asia in the same lines of products and there was a glut in the global market. So that doesn't help. My point is that we need to understand that this entire dynamics of export, import and the trade balance and current account deficit, what they exactly mean for the internal domestic economy, they are basically different components and they have to be treated different. as differently, you know, and we have to have an holistic view in terms of the policy responses. Okay, we, we are, I think we are putting too much emphasis on exchange rate and currency. Okay, uh, we are joined by a caller right now from uh, Jammu and Kashmir, uh, Ms. Arushi. Please put your question, Arushi. Yeah, good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Now I wanted to know one thing, um, all the panelists uh, who are talking about the fluctuations in the value of the money have not uh, noticed one thing and talked about it yet, that is, uh, if we go by month by uh, analysis of the recent depreciation, have been a trend which has been followed really that during the month of December, because most of the countries who, who invest in our economy are uh, the European countries or America. So they are the countries who close to the Christmas and the New Year celebration have to get the land up to the employees and for that they need the money back. So we are definitely going to see these people the money back and then we for sure going to see the depreciation of the money. So why is that so the hysteria has been created because this is something that is going to be a two and throw process. One more thing that I want to know is, um, this is a very general, perhaps basic economic question, but I don't have the knowledge of this, and that is, I wanted to know the basic difference between FIIs and FDIs. Okay. Thanks very question. much. Thanks very much, Arushi, for both those questions. Uh, uh, would you like to respond to that, Dr. Raval? Or I think, uh, Dr. Ravatashari, please respond to this question. Well, the FDI is called foreign direct investment. When investment comes to generate physical investment leading to output and employment, say factory created out of the foreign capital, or it could be a new business activity arising out of the foreign capital, they are called FDI. <coughs> FDI adds to the total domestic investment. It's part of the total domestic investment. FII, foreign institutional investment, is basically there are already investment made in the country, you are trading in them. It could be in the form of stock market, it could be in the form of the currency market, it could be in form of government bonds. So here, you are not adding directly to new capital. You are trading in the existing capital and making whatever the returns are to be. So FDI and FII, mm -hmm. therefore, they are totally different to nature. FDI is adding to your capital formation. FII mm -hmm. is trading in your existing capital formation. Mm -hmm. So that is the basic difference between the two. 
Okay. And also she was talking about the trend which happens to be a two and four thing, the money appreciation, the depreciation, because it has to meet also the requirements of the advanced economies and uh, obviously the, the emerging economies will have to share the responsibilities. Here. Well, ultimately each economy is bothered about its own. We are not bothered about what is happening to U.S. and Russia or Germany. Mm -hmm. We have to think about our own economic welfare. Mm -hmm. So, no country in the world, at least certainly not India at present. Mm -hmm. All the things we may talk about the global, or here and there, give little money from Nepal or Afghanistan. Essentially, we are concerned about ourselves. Those kind of questions should be addressed at the World Bank and IMF, mm -hmm. looking at the global optimal balance. Right. Okay, uh, one important question here is that where exactly should the highest priority be given when it comes to our own policies in order to deal with this? Should it be given to growth and controlling these inflows or controlling inflation, liquidity on the domestic front and in order to boost the export uh, sector? I mean, where exactly should the policy be really... Uh, we raise a very good question. The nation or the government needs to really identify clearly multiple objectives, that's really a subjective, and then assign them priorities. One of the most important priorities for any government, in my opinion, is that how can the government raise the quality of life of its people, which, which encompasses almost all other objectives. For instance, raising employment, raising salaries, providing them good infrastructure, providing them goods and services at cheaper rates, and so on and so forth. So how can we really raise the quality of life in that? When we talk about the mechanism, the mechanism needs to take into consideration a realistic rate of rupee vis-a-vis -vis other currencies. Mm -hmm. and when we talk about realistic rate, then we need to make a comparison between the PPP. Originally, the rates were determined on the basis of purchasing power parity. Later on, it was determined on the basis of demand and supply, international demand and supply for currency. Somebody who can influence demand and somebody who can influence supply, which means the foreign exchange trader can even influence this. Now, when we talk about this, what is in the best interest? Not, not of one particular sector. Of course, that sector cannot, cannot be ignored altogether. Mm -hmm. Now, when we say this, then it is necessary that in a country like India, which has a large emerging market, large population to be using goods and services, and scarcity of goods and services, as we have found in the last eight months, inflation is fairly high. That means the goods and services are not sufficient to meet the demand of the people. And therefore, to supply more goods to earn less amount of, you know, dollars, probably mm -hmm. is not justified policy. And one of the studies has even indicated that the growth in terms of, in dollar terms, for exports is much lower than the, the, the growth in terms of rupee. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you are not earning enough of dollar, then why do you really reduce the value of currency? Mm -hmm. and, and then, internationally, the prestige of a nation, in my opinion, to a great extent, and also its strength, economic strength, is clearly indicated what is the value of that currency. I remember in 1982, a pound sterling was almost equal to a dollar. Because there were three years there was a coal miners' strike. And because of the coal miners' strike in UK, and the value of the pound went down. Mm -hmm. Today it is almost 1.8. And mm -hmm. even before, in 1980, a pound sterling was equal to uh, 1.8 dollars or so. Now if we really, and then we gradually, mm -hmm. after the coal miners' strike went off, right. the, the UK economy it's got strength. And its currency also becomes a oh, very, very important point there. We are joined by our, uh, a caller from um, uh, from Patna, Mr. Gaurav. Please put your question. Okay, okay. Thanks very much, Gaurav, for that question. Time for a very short break here in the public forum. Stay tuned.
which also means that there, there is greater share of wealthy countries in global affairs and even developed countries' performance mm. on the sub mm. Number two, recently IMF uh, executive director uh, and others have uh, talked about the importance of capital control or any other measure which actually does not facilitate the crisis further. Mm. This is a big factor. I mean, at one point of time, we could never imagine that IMF or World Bank uh, saying something of this kind. Uh, because their whole ideology of paradigm is yes. very, very, very neoliberal and very distinct. So I think in G20, if you ask me to do something one sentence, I would consider not to be a great success, but a step towards developed world and global financial and development institutions seeing the world through the eyes of developing countries and through the eyes of emerging countries. There's a new landscape altogether of deficit as well as surplus nations after the crisis. And what is really expected, especially from the emerging economies, developing economies, is a greater role of the IMF. Is, uh, are we really expecting that thing really coming up um, in this mm -hmm. room? <coughs> Two things. One is increasing the role of emerging countries in IMF and world and decision making. The other is the relative importance of IMF per se mm -hmm. in influencing the global economic decisions. Now, <coughs> say 20 years ago, IMF had a decisive say in shaping economic policies, say including India. IMF conditionalities based on the loans given by the IMF virtually shaped the liberalization program in many countries, including India. So those days, IMF was supreme. Today, <coughs> Just before the crisis, the stage came, the IMF itself went in such a crisis. Questions were raised about existence of IMF. Because if the member nations like India, China, etc. become strong enough, they don't depend on IMF, few billion dollars. Then IMF relative importance in global policy goes down. And that's what has happened. The biggest question today is asked is, what was the role of IMF in this present global recession? Why they could not anticipate? Why they could not intervene? Such a mega catastrophe has occurred, and IMF remain a silent spectator. So, in fact, there are strong views that aired at the time, <coughs> many respected November economists have said, disband the IMF and World Bank and reconstitute hmm. the Bretton Woods Agreement, which is 60 plus years old right now, 60 years old. So, the other point which I refer to is increasing influence of emerging economies in IMF. That is happening. And in the latest G20 meeting, it is promised further increase in the share of emerging economies, including India, hmm. in the IMF and World Bank decision making. But that will not be today as a time sequence. Right. So, hopefully, it will be done. What it means is there is a traumatic change in the global political economic decision making. Even until five years ago, the developed countries DA telling the emerging economies this is what we should do. Now they are saying no. <coughs> we will also treat you as a partner, not a dependency system anymore. This is the traumatic change result of the global decision. We are not going to develop country anymore saying, you please help us. Mm -hmm. yeah. They are rather telling, America telling China, please help us in restoring my economy. Mm -hmm. You see the development change. We wish someday India will also come to that state. We are doing in a minor way. Mm -hmm. But China, for instance, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, where was China? Nothing. Today, America and Europe telling, please rescue us. It is also important for India because Prime Minister is already on his visit to East Asia and it is also important to look at our trade ties with these countries, especially the ASEAN nations and the other nations, because that is perhaps lesser than what we have with China. Do you think that happens to be one important area where we need to really have a uh, good... This is a, an excellent initiative taken by the government, but we have to look towards this. We need to make our own presence for both in terms of economic policies as well as as a part of international relations. We live in Asia and we need to really improve upon the quality of life, not only in India but also in the whole of Asia and make our presence there. Trade 
free trade, for instance, you would like it to be possible with Malaysia, which is the Navy between the time of the and the uh, uh, maybe, maybe sometime early in 2011. And that would really be a, a very good, very good stance which has been taken. Mm -hmm. Similarly, now he is going to Japan and where he is going to likely to enter into some kind of trade pacts. I, I think uh, uh, it would be really good because the, the, the prices, the cost of various goods and services in Asia are much cheaper than in the West. And if there is a free trade, the quality of life would probably, in the whole of Asia, would improve. Although the level of poverty in the Asia is the largest, is the biggest problem uh, in the whole world. As far as I am concerned, if I use my uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, say, Malaysia, the first prescription which I am at least, although their job is to provide macroeconomic financial stability internationally and different countries, 1998, IMF made some prescriptions to Malaysia. Malaysia ignored them, went ahead, they had gone ahead with their own model, and they would come out of the financial crisis which they were facing. Nigeria, in 1983, wanted $2 billion loan from IMF. They straight away said, we have the occurrence. Mm. They refused. Yeah. Yeah, it is against the plastic regulation. Mm. And at that time, one Naira of Nigerian was equal to $2.6. Today, one dollar is equal to more than 250 Naira. Mm. That is the state of affairs in the last 28 years or so. Now, these prescriptions are, by the time this help reaches the the, the, the desiring or, or the needy country, it becomes too late and the country becomes even this more impacts, difficult. Yeah, this impacts, yeah, this impacts, this is the, this is the way, it, it, it in fact uh, brings us to another point here. But uh, very quickly, Dr. Das, we are almost heading towards the end of this program. Uh, very important here is that if at all we talk about the existence of these emerging economies, because this is the time when the world is debating and the world is in fact uh, going to face a new uh, international economic order. Looking at it, do you think that the, uh, the, the emerging economies need to also sort out the, their policies in terms of the political relations they have and also improve the economic ties they have in order to have a good cluster or let's say a very healthy cluster of these economies? Certainly. I mean, uh, I think economics and politics in the international uh, domain go hand in hand. Uh, one feeds on the other. And uh, just the reverse also can happen. So I'm very sure that the time will come when the economic gravity of the world has already shifted to Asia and uh, the major economies of the West are actually trying to integrate more with Asia. There, the role that India can play, the role that China can play, I think would be looked up to. Uh, with great expectation, and I am very sure that India is slowly getting prepared to get into the production and economic network. What is your view, Dr. Professor? I must have Well, definitely India will be increasingly more and more important, even <coughs> in the global financial world, there is no doubt about it. But you have not yet come to a stage like China, where we could dictate the time will be now gaining increasing importance. But China, for whatever the reason, has got into a position to shake the West. The currency war is a result of Chinese stubborn refusal. Whereas <coughs> if India plays supposing a currency war, uh, the rest of the world would not be losing their sleep. Mm. So, what we need to do therefore, yeah. we must maintain a stable economic policy, okay. to gradually gain more and more strength, mm -hmm. and not take adventurous policy. Okay. So, there are lessons for us and there are lessons <coughs> for other economies also to learn from this. Thanks very much, gentlemen. This has been a pleasure. That is all we have for in this edition of Public Forum. Thanks very much for watching this. Thanks. Very much.